The last few videos have considered the types of sedimentary structures and facies that are formed in different types of rivers, but as you may know if you've been to the Grand Canyon or even observed some of the local rivers around Santa Cruz, uh, rivers don't always deposit sediment. They may incise or cut down into the underlying layers, in which case they're actively eroding and transporting sediment rather than depositing it. This video will discuss the factors that control whether a river incises or aggrades. Aggradation refers to the active building up of sediment by the river. I'll also introduce two very important concepts that we'll come back to later on. The concept of base level and the concept of accommodation spaces, which, is, which are fundamental parts of a topic called sequence stratigraphy. Sequence stratigraphy basically describes the effects of changing base level, which I'll explain in a minute, on the patterns of sediment deposition. It's a really fundamental way of integrating and explaining why you have certain patterns of facies in depositional environments. It's also really best developed in coastal depositional environments, so we're going to come back to it and integrate it throughout the rest of this class. The elevation of a river follows a longitudinal profile from its source to its, its river mouth called a graded profile, which is controlled, at least in a general sense, by the elevation of the source area and the elevation of the mouth. The mouth, at least in a river that flows to the ocean, reaches sea level, and sea level is something called base level, or base level is approximately equal to sea level. We'll come back to this and talk about it in more detail in a couple weeks. So base level is a very important concept in sequence stratigraphy, both for rivers and for sediment accumulation in coastal environments. And as I said, it's approximately equal to sea level. So the shape of the graded profile is therefore influenced by the position of base level, which is itself a function of global sea level or used to sea. The graded profile is also influenced by tectonic subsidence, which can occur, which can influence base level if the subsidence is occurring near the coastline, or it can affect the, the elevation of the source area. Likewise, climate itself actually also influences um, the graded profile through its influence on river discharge and the balance between transport capacity and the sediment load. But for simplicity, at least for today, we'll just consider simple base level cycles caused by eustatic changes. But note that the effects of eustacy on fluvial behavior decrease in importance as you move inland or upstream from the shoreline. So once you reach a certain point, inland towards the proximal end of the river, it's far enough from the ocean that eustatic sea level is no longer a significant effect on, on the graded profile. The term sequence stratigraphy gets its name from the concept of a depositional sequence, which is a complete cycle of base level, uh, in this case from zero up to the peak, down to the trough, and then back to zero again. This diagram actually shows one and a half base level cycles if you go from the left all the way over to the right hand side. So also note that this is just a schematic diagram. Base level cycles in the real world don't have to be symmetrical like this or, or, or regular. The fall can be shorter than the rise or vice versa. Uh, they don't have to have the same amount of rise and fall. So this is just a, a very schematic way of illustrating base level. So first, let's consider the effect that rising base level has on a fluvial system. So imagine that the river occupies some initial equilibrium profile. Now base level rises. So now the new equilibrium profile is located at an elevation higher than the initial one. So the space between the initial equilibrium profile and the current equilibrium profile, or its new equilibrium position, is called accommodation space. Because there is this space and the river wants to be higher up, it wants to have a shallower equilibrium profile, the river aggrades, sediment is deposited, and the river builds upwards to reach the new equilibrium profile. Now let's consider the opposite case um, where base level is falling. So in this situation, the river starts at the initial equilibrium profile, the base level falls, the new equilibrium profile is now at a lower elevation than the initial profile, so there is negative accommodation space, and the river will incise or erode through the older sediments to reach that new equilibrium position. We're really most interested in understanding how fluvial type, whether it's braided or meandering, the channel geometry or channel stacking pattern, which we'll come back to in a minute, and the facies, such as the grain size, differ throughout this base level cycle. 
Um, the channel geometry, as I said, I'll explain a little bit more soon, but it basically refers to the relative proportion of channel and overbank deposits, where the channels are single and isolated within a lot of overbank sediment, or where the channels amalgamate one on top of each other without a lot of overbank sediment. As I already mentioned, accommodation space is negative during base level fall, so the river incises instead of depositing sediment. There can uh, certainly be small terrace deposits left behind, the little dark um, shoulders perching on the edge of this valley here. Um, but generally the sedimentary record of base level fall will be the formation of some deeply eroded valley called an incised valley. Soils, which are called paleosols in the sedimentary rock record, can form in what's called the interfluve, the area between these incising river valleys. But as a good rule of thumb, there's really basically no sediment preserved from the time of base level fall. What that means is that all of the sedimentary deposits that you will observe were deposited during base level rise. So, during the early parts of base level rise, accommodation space is being created. So the river will aggrade and deposit sediment to try and keep up with that rising base level. To try and have its equilibrium profile uh, match the, the rising equilibrium profile due to base level. So if we consider the simple case here where base level is being driven just by eustatic fluctuations and the elevation of the source area is unchanged, what that means is that the equilibrium graded profile will be the steepest just at the beginning of base level rise. So after base level fall has completed, base level is at its lowest point, if the elevation of the, of the headwaters is at the same point, the equilibrium graded profile will be, will be steep. There also may be more available coarse sediment at this point in the base level cycle because the incised valley was actively eroding, so it would be breaking down a lot of rock and producing a lot of sediment. Um, so, as we've already seen in previous classes, braided rivers tend to have steeper gradients. So what that means is, all else being equal, low accommodation fluvial deposits, the ones that form at the beginning of base level rise, are more likely to be higher energy and coarser grain fluvial systems. They may often be, although not always, but may often be braided rivers, like the example shown here. So in this example, this is a very sand-rich river, so it's just sand deposits. Um, there's very little overbank sediment preserved, and this large bed form with these angled layers that you see making up the bottom half of the cliff, um, these dipping forsets are downstream accretion surfaces of a large bar. So in addition to having a steep gradient, at the beginning of base level rise, the rate at which base level is rising and therefore the rate at which accommodation space is being created um, is slow. And that has very important consequences. Uh, this means that the rate of aggradation, the rate at which the channel builds upwards, is also slow. So this has important but kind of complicated um, impacts on the geometry of the fluvial deposits. So as I said, it can be a little bit difficult to visualize, but let's consider a meandering fluvial system. In this case, uh, we have a channel that migrates from one side of the floodplain across to the other side, turns around and then goes back to the first side. It goes back and forth across this, this channel. Um, as it does that, as it's moving back and forth, it erodes through previously deposited sediment. That may be the sediment that it just deposited, or it may be older sediment. So if the river remains at the same elevation, the channel will just continuously erode through the same layer of sediment goes back and forth and back and forth, and it's just reworking the exact same sediment every single time, because it's not moving upwards, it's not moving downwards. But if the river does a grade, so if it does a grade slowly, the channel will be moving upwards slowly, and therefore you can imagine it'll be kind of a slightly higher elevation when it turns around to move back to the other side of the floodplain. So because of that, the erosion of this channel will not remove all of the previous sediment layer. It'll remove a lot of it, perhaps, but there'll be a little bit, just the lowest parts of the previous channel deposit left behind. That will be overlain by the new channel. Um, on the other hand, if the rate of aggradation is really high, the channel will be, will be aggrading upwards very quickly. And this means that it'll be at a much higher elevation before it turns around and starts moving back across the floodplain to its initial position. So as a result, 
all the original channel and maybe even a lot of the floodplain sediments may be preserved below the elevation of the new channel deposit. So because of that interaction between the rate of lateral migration, we use the example of a meandering river, but it applies equally well to braided rivers where the channels migrate back and forth somewhat more erratically. Um, so because of the interaction between the lateral migration rate and the rate of upward aggradation, the low accommodation fluvial channels, the ones deposited when the rate of base level rise is slow, are dominated by these stacked or amalgamated channel deposits with very little or no floodplain sediment preserved. These stacked or amalgamated channels are also sometimes called multi-story channels because it's like they have multiple levels of channel and no overbank. So in this picture here, each of these kind of lighter brown cream colored ledges is the basal part of a single channel. But you can see that they're just stacked one on top of, of, of another. So this is actually just the bottom part. The rest of it's been eroded away when the river moved back across and all we're left with is just the very bottom part amalgamated and stacked one on top of one another. So when the rate of base level rise is high, the deposits are called high accommodation fluvial deposits and they're characterized instead by isolated or single story channels. Um, these are channels that tend to be on their own but within a very thick package of floodplain or overbank deposits. As I said before, this is because the fluvial system is aggrading upwards quickly enough that the lateral migration of the channel doesn't remove very much of the original deposits or the previous deposits. In terms of thickness, high accommodation successions actually probably make up most of a typical fluvial depositional sequence. These high accommodation deposits are often dominated by lower energy fluvial systems with a lot of overbank sediments. The previous picture and this picture both illustrate that. Um, so in this photo here, uh, the, the thin resistant layers that stick out, as well as the sort of large deposit at the bottom, um, are sandstones uh, in the overbank above, and this is the channel at the bottom here. The kind of crumbly slope forming bits are the fine-grained overbank sediments. Uh, they make up a fairly large proportion of the total thickness in this outcrop, uh, which is typical of, of meandering fluvial systems. Um, these dipping layers that you see in the thick bottom unit are, are the lateral accretion surfaces as the point bar migrated from, uh, from right to left. Um, we can only tell that, you can only really tell that by looking at the paleocurrents, but because this is a meandering fluvial system, these are likely lateral accretion surfaces. So sequence stratigraphy is such an integral and important topic because it provides a uniform framework for interpreting and predicting the vertical succession of facies. Really, you know, not a lot of sedimentology makes sense without this context provided by the base level changes because they're what's governing the vertical relationship of different facies. And you can actually predict a lot of the details, in this case about fluvial type or grain size or the channel, checking pat channel stacking patterns and so forth uh, just from changes in the equilibrium profile and changes in the rate of accommodation space creation. Of course, you know, every situation is unique and there are lots of other local factors that are going to influence river type and grain size and, and channel stacking and so forth. So because sequence stratigraphy is such a fundamental underpinning of all of sedimentology, we're going to be integrating these concepts and building upon the concepts of base level and accommodation space throughout the rest of this class. And in particular, when we're discussing coastal marine facies, where base level changes are really extremely important in governing the relationship between facies.